The indictment contains four basic points concerning me. First point. I consider myself to be a regenerator of religion as though I were prompt and self-seeking. I reject this with all my strength. Moreover, all my brothers will testify that I have never accepted anyone's suggestion that I was the Mahdi. In fact, when the experts committee of Denis Le Court said, if Said was to declare himself Mahdi, all his students would accept it. Said stated in his objections, saying, I am not a Sayyid, and the Mahdi will be a Sayyid, thus refuting them. Second point, publishing things secretly. Our coward enemies should not misconstrue things, for there is nothing that touches on politics and public order. Also, they should not make the duplicating machine and the old letters a pretext. Six courts of law and various departments of government in Ankara understood the blow dealt by the Risale Nur at Mustafa Kemal and they did not bother about it and acquitted us, returning all our books to us including the fifth ray. Note, the wrong meaning has been given in the indictment for it has deemed an offense some instances of the Risale Nur's wonder working which took the form of slaps. As though disasters like the earthquakes that occur when the Risale Nur is attacked are blows dealt by the Risale Nur. God forbid, we never said such a thing nor wrote it. What we said in many places supported by proof was that like acceptable ants giving, the Risale Nur is a means of repulsing disasters. Whenever it is attacked, it hides itself, then calamity sees the opportunity and assault us. Yes, confirmed by thousands of Risale Nur students and what they have observed, supported by hundreds of incidents and events and their coincidences, which in no way could have been attributed to chance, as well as numerous indications and coincidences of the Quran, some of which were even pointed out in court, I have formed the certain conviction that those coincidences are a divine bestowal indicating the Risale Nur's acceptability and are a sort of wonder of the Risale Nur on account of the Quran. Moreover, his bad deeds were pointed out in order to preserve the army's worth. One person was disliked in order to affectionately praise the army. The third, he encourages the breaching of public security. This extraordinary accusation is refuted by the facts that, over a period of 20 years, six courts and the police of 10 provinces have not recorded a single instance when any of the 100,000 Nur Jews and 100,000 copies of parts of the Risale Nur breached public security or disturbed public order, and they have not found any such thing. It is meaningless to reply to a few unimportant matters in this new indictment, for three courts of law have acquitted us on these very points and they have been replied to repeatedly. Since charging us with these matters is the equivalent of charging Ankara Criminal Court and the courts of Denizli and Eskshire, which acquitted us concerning them, I leave it to them to reply. But there are two or three further matters. The first, although it was studied for two years in the closest detail by Denizli and Ankara Criminal Courts and they acquitted us and returned the book this indictment applies one or two matters in the fifth ray to a commander who is dead and gone and shows them to be indictable offenses. So we say, absolutely no law can deem it an offense to make a fair general criticism which might be made applicable to a person who dead and gone and has no connection with the government. Manipulating the facts the prosecution has taken one aspect of that general interpretation and applied it to that commander. No law can consider it a crime if one hundredth of a meaning which may be understood as referring to someone is found in a confidential and private treatise. Moreover, the treatise expounds allegorical hadith in wondrous fashion. Since those explanations were written thirty or thirty years ago, and decisive answers have been given in my defense and objections which have been presented to three other courts besides yours 
and to six departments of government in Ankara and have received no criticism, surely it cannot be considered to be at variance with any law if explanations of the Hadith's true meaning turn out to fit a faulty individual. Also, the merits of the reforms in which that person had a part, the faults of which he was the cause, are not only his, they are also the armies and the governments. He only had a share of them. Just as it is surely not a crime to criticize him for his faults, so it cannot be said it is attacking the reforms. Also, could it possibly be a crime not to like someone who turned the Hagia Sophia mosque into a house of idols, despite its being an eternal source of this heroic nation's honor and shining like a jewel in its jihad and service of the Quran and being a vest and precious souvenir of the nation's swords and who also transformed the Shaykh Islam's office into a girl's high school? The second matter with which I am charged in the indictment. Three courts of law have acquitted me on this matter and as I pointed out 40 years ago when elucidating the wondrous interpretation of a hadith, the Shaykh Islam of man and jinn, Zambilla al Efendi, stated, it is not permissible to put a brimmed hat on one's hat even as a joke and all the Shaykh Islams and all the Islamic ulama considered it impermissible. The mass of Muslims were therefore in danger when they were forced to wear such hats, that is, they either had to renounce their religion or rebel. But since in one section of the fifth ray, which was written 40 years ago, it says, the wearing of the brim's hat will be enforced and prostration in prayer will be forbidden. But the faith in the hats of those wearing, it will make the head prostrate, God willing, making it Muslim. It saved the mass of Muslims both from rebellion and revolt and from voluntarily renouncing their religion and belief. And although no law at all can propose such a thing to those living in seclusion, and in 20 years none of six provincial authorities have forced me to wear it, and officials in their offices, and women and children, and people in the mosques, and the majority of villagers are not compelled to wear it, and it has now been officially taken off the soldiers' hats, and in many provinces now berets and needed hats are not prohibited, nevertheless it has been put forward as a reason for the conviction of myself and my brothers. Could any law in the world, any principle, any good, consider this completely meaningless charge to be a crime? The third matter with which I am charged. Indictment to breach public security in Emirda. My objection to this is as follows. Firstly, is my irrefutable list of objections which has been presented to the court here and to six departments of government in Ankara with this court's knowledge and permission. I am now stating it exactly in answer to the indictment. Secondly, as is testified to by all those who met with me in Emirda and is confirmed by its people and police, in my solitude I avoided involvement in politics with all my power. I even gave up writing and corresponding with others. I wrote nothing apart from two pieces, one on repetition in the Quran, the other about the angels. And I used to write one letter a week to one place to encourage people in the Risale Nur. In fact, in three years I wrote only three or four letters to my own brother who is a Mufti and for twenty years was with me as my student and was very anxious about me and sent me congratulations for the religious festivals. And although for 20 years I have not written once to my brother who is in my native region, I am accused in the indictment of breaching security and once again of opposing the reforms. In reply, I say this. The fact that in 20 years six courts of law and the police of 10 provinces connected with the matter have not recorded any incident involving the disturbance of public order and breaching of security in connection with the 20,000 or perhaps 100,000 people who enthusiastically read the 20,000 copies of the Risale Nur 
shows that it looks on a single possibility out of thousands as being established fact. But if there is no sign of anything concerning one possibility out of two or three, there can be no crime. And it is not one possibility out of thousands, but everyone including the prosecutor who attacks me could kill numerous people, they could disturb public peace and order on account of communism and breach security. That is to say, it is contempt of court and the law to put forward extraordinary and exaggerated possibilities in place of actualities. Furthermore, every government has opponents. It is no crime to oppose a government purely intellectually. The government looks to the hand, not to the heart. Especially someone who has performed great services for this country and nation and caused no harm and literally played no part in the life of society, but has been made to life in absolute isolation and whose works have been appreciated and applauded in the most important centers of the Islamic world. Note, in the 18th of the 100 errors about these works in the indictment, the prosecution says, the interpretations in the fifth ray are incorrect. The answer, in the fifth ray, it is said, God knows best one interpretation is this. What this means is, it is possible that one meaning of the hadith is this. Logically, this cannot be proved wrong. It can be proved wrong only by proving its impossibility. Secondly, although for the past 20 years, indeed 40 years, those who opposed me and then those who tried to oppose the Risale Nur have not refuted my interpretations on grounds of either logic or scholarship and thousands of learned people, the religious scholars who oppose me together with the Risale Nur students have confirmed them and have not said he has been smitten by the evil eye. I refer it to your fair-mindedness to judge just how unjust. It is for those who do not know how many surahs there are in the Quran to meet them incredulously. In short, the meaning of interpretation is one probable or possible meaning of a hadith or Quranic verse out of many. I fear that those who level this quite extraordinary Groundless accusations at such persons are unknowingly being exploited on account of anarchy, indeed communism. I have understood from certain signs that with the idea of belittling the Risale Nur and due to groundless suspicions about the Mehdi question which has political associations, our coward enemies are investigating completely baseless suggestions that the Risale Nur is being exploited for this. Perhaps it is because of these suspicions that I am made to suffer such torments. I say to those tyrannical secret enemies and to those who listen to them out of hostility to us, God forbid, again God forbid, both my 75 year life and especially these last 30 years and the 130 parts of the Salinur and the thousands of people who have offered me their sincere friendship testify that at no time have I overstepped my neck in such a way and made the truth of belief a means of winning rank, fame and renown for myself. Yes, the Risale Nur students know and I have pointed out proofs of it in the courts that not to gain for myself any position or fame and win spiritual rank and a high rank in the hereafter, but in order to serve the believers with all my conviction and strength in the question of belief, I am ready to sacrifice not only my life in this world and its transcend ranks, but, if necessary, my life in the hereafter and its everlasting ranks, which everyone seeks, and even in order to be a means of saving certain unfortunates from hell, if necessary, to forego paradise and myself go to hell. Just as my true brothers know this, so I have proved it in some respects in the courts. Accusing me in this way of insincerity in my service of the Risale Nur and belief and depreciating the Risale Nur and devaluing it will deprive this nation of its sublime truth. If, because they imagine this world is eternal and that like themselves everyone exploits religion and belief for the world, 
This wretches ascribe worldly motives to someone who challenges all the people of misguidance in this world, is ready to sacrifice his lives both in this world and if necessary in the next, and as he claimed in the courts, would not exchange a single truth of belief for rule of the whole world, and out of sincerity and its mystery flees with all his strength from politics and all ranks, material and spiritual, which hint of politics, and has endured unequaled torments for twenty years, and due to his way, has not condescended to any involvement in politics, and with respect to himself considers himself far inferior to his students, and believes himself to be truly wretched and unimportant, if because of the extraordinary strength of belief they have obtained from their Salinur, some of his sincere brothers ascribe to him in their private letters some of the virtues of their Salinur, because he is their interpreter, and in consequence of a custom which has absolutely no political overtones, they afford him a high rank, like people call ordinary persons they love, my lord, my benefactor, and they think much better of him than he deserves, and follow the old, acceptable custom practiced between master and students, which is not objected to, and has the meaning of thanks, and praise him excessively, and write exaggerated eulogies, which has long been the custom to write at the ends of acceptable books. If they do these things, can it any way be considered a crime? For sure, it is opposed to the truth in a way, since it is aggregation, but he is a stranger, alone, with numerous enemies, and there are numerous things to make him lose his helpers. So, purely in order to strengthen their moral in the face of so many opponents, and to prevent them fleeing, and not to destroy the enthusiasm of those who praised him excessively, he changed part of what they had written, so that it referred to the Salinur, and did not reject it outright. It may be understood, therefore, just how far from the truth, the law and fair-mindedness certain officials have fallen when they try to make the above person's service of belief look to this world, despite his age and his being at the door of the grave. My last word is, and for every calamity we belong to God, and to him is our return. Said Norsi Supplement I saw that it was written on the back of the last report concerning the investigations of the examining magistrate. Four months ago, the decision was taken by the cabinet to officially prohibit the distribution of the miraculousness of the Quran, that is, the 25th word, on the pretext that its explanations of three verses against civilization were not in conformity with the present civil code. My reply to this, the miraculousness of the Quran is now part of Zulfikar, and on only two pages of the 400 pages of Zulfikar are explanations of the three verses which reply in a way that cannot be objected to, to some of civilization's criticisms of the Qur'an and were included in three of my old treatises. One of the verses is about the veiling of women, the second, and to the mother, a sixth, is about inheritance, as is the third, and for the man, a portion equal to that of two women. I expounded the wisdom of these verses, meanings, in a way that would silence the philosophers in two pages twenty years ago, and in my other treatises thirty years ago. It is therefore our legal right, instead of banning the four hundred pages of Fikar, on the suspicion that it was written now, to excise those two pages from it and return the book to us, just as if a letter contains one or two harmful words, those words are cut out and the publication of the rest is permitted. We seek our rights from your just courts in this matter. Since nobody could find the opportunity to come to read me the 40-page indictment, which was given me a month ago, they read it to me today, 11th June, for the first time. I listened to it, and I saw that the list of my objections which I wrote for you two months ago, and the appendix and addendum to my objections of nearly a month ago, had been given to both six departments of government in Ankara and to your office.
Those objections refute and demolish that indictment. I see absolutely no necessity to rewrite the objections to it. I only say now in order to recall to the prosecution the following two or three points. The reason I did not take the indictment into consideration and reply to it was to avoid insulting the honor of the three just courts that had acquitted us and being in contempt of them. For those courts acquitted us after studying in the minutest detail all the points in the present indictment. To completely disregard their acquittals is to insult the honor of the judiciary. Second point. Due to its gross misinterpretations, attaching unimaginable meanings to one or two matters out of thousands, the prosecution accuses us of certain offenses. However, those matters are in the large collections of the risale norm. The ulama of al Azhar University in Cairo, the leading scholars of Damascus, the exacting scholars of Mecca and Medina and of Aleppo and so on, and especially the investigative scholars of the Directorate of Religious Affairs have all seen them and have praised them appreciatively and put their signatures to them. So it was with astonishments and bewilderment that I saw the pseudo-scholarly objections in the indictment. Even if I had made some errors and the indictment was correct in what it imputed, although thousands of scholars had not spotted them or objected to them, they still would not constitute a crime, they would only be scholarly errors. Moreover, three courts have acquitted the entire Risale Nur and ourselves. Only Eskishayir court gave light sentences to myself and 15 out of a hundred of my companions because of 15 words in the 24th flesh, which is about the veiling of women. I wrote in the addendum to my objections that if there is justice on the face of the earth, it would not accept my being convicted for expounding that verse and complying with what was laid down in 350,000 Quranic commentaries. As though collecting water from a thousand streams and in its cleverness, the prosecution tried to use against us a number of points in books and letters written over 20 years. That makes the not three, but five or six courts which acquitted us on this point our accomplices in this imaginary crime. I am reminding the prosecution not to insult the honor of those just courts. The third, even if explicitly to criticize and object to a leader who is dead and gone, whose relations with the government have ceased and who was the cause of certain faults in the reforms cannot be a legal offense. But there was not anything explicit. The persecution applied my general statements to him through its misinterpretations. It publicized those confidential meanings which we do not tell to everyone and drew everyone's attention to them. If there is any crime involved, the persecution is guilty because it is inciting the people and attracting their attention to those meanings. The fourth, due to baseless suspicions, repeating the same old story, collecting water from a thousand streams, the persecution investigated hints of a secret society despite our unequivocal acquittal on this point by three courts. However, while there are numerous political societies which are harmful for this nation and country, which they permit and look on tolerantly, to call a secret society the soldiery of the Risalinur students, with their fellow students, which as established by the testimony of thousands of witnesses and signs and the fact that six promises did not interfere with us, is solely for the good of the country, nation and religion on account of happiness in this world and the next, and to strive against the currents from inside and outside the country, which are bent on corruption and like the persecution to accuse them of exploiting religion and inciting the people to disturb public order and breach security, although in 20 years not one single such incident has been recorded in connection with the Risalinur students, will bring not mankind but the earth to anger, thus rejecting such an accusation. However, there is no need to say anything further. 
My written objections and its addendum, which were written long before the indictment, are my reply to it. Prisoner Said Nursi, Afyon Prison. In his name be he glorified. I say this to Afyon Court and the chief criminal judge. Because since my early youth I could not endure to be dominated, I severed my relations with the world. Now life has become a great burden for me with this meaningless, unnecessary oppression. I do not have the power to endure the persecution of thousands of officials outside. I am fed up with this sort of life. With all my strength, I am requesting you to sentence me. To enter the grave is not within my power and I have to remain in prison. You too know that the unsubstantiated crimes the persecution accuses me of are non-existent. I cannot be convicted because of them. However, I have serious faults before my true duties for which I can in effect be convicted. If it is appropriate to ask, I shall reply to your question. Yes, my only crime out of my serious faults is this. It occurred to me here in Afyon prison that in the view of reality it was an unforgivable fault that, because I had not looked to the world, I had not performed the weighty duty with which I had been charged in the name of the country, nation and religion and my not knowing this did not excuse me. The fact that three courts have acquitted us in this respect shows just how far from truth and justice those have fallen who give the name of a worldly political society to their Salinor students, disinterested attachment to their Salinor and its interpreter which looks purely to the hereafter and try to show that they are guilty of a criminal office. We too say, the basis and foundation of human society and particularly the Islamic nation are the sincere bonds between relatives and the concerned attachment between tribes and groups and due to Islamic nationhood, the spiritual brotherhood and mutual assistance between believers and the devotion to one's nation and unshakable attachment to and partiality for the truths of the Quran and those who propagate them. It is only by denying these bonds which ensure the life of society and by accepting the red peril which scatters the terrible seed of anarchy from the north which ruins the younger generation and nationhood and drawing to itself everyone's children, destroys kinship and nationhood and opens up the way to the complete corruption of human civilization and the life of society that the Risalinur students can be called a political society which is an indictable offense. For this reason, true students of the Risalinur proclaim openly their sacred attachment to the truths of the Quran and their unshakable bonds of brotherhood which look to the hereafter. Because they are happy to accept any penalty they may receive because of that brotherhood, they admit in your just court the truth as it is. They do not stoop to defend themselves with lies, scoffancy and cunning. Prisoner Said Nursi